Hey guys, it's Chris Stallion for Hobby Game Dev. This will be a short talk about Japanese video game development with an emphasis on what they do differently from American video game development. This is actually information that's been on my blog now at Hobby Game Dev for several years, but I thought repackaging it as a short talk could help it reach a new audience. And I really think it's information worth sharing. Now where this began is an old quote by Tony Robbins that if you want to be successful, find someone who's achieved the results you want, copy what they do, and you'll achieve the same results. Now, like any inspirational quote, there's a lot of exceptions to this. There's a lot of caveats, a lot of details. You can write a book on it. But in practice, I do believe that if you want the kind of results someone else gets, it helps to look at their process, to look at their method, to look at the, their values and their situation. And I've always personally preferred Japanese games, with a few exceptions, to the American ones. And so, as an early person in my career, I was curious to learn more about what Japanese game development environments looked like in contrast to typical American teams as a product of American culture. At the time, I had a mentor, David C. Holzer. And David C. Holzer has been in the video game industry for a long time. Uh, he worked at Nova Logic, he worked at Electronic Arts. One of the things that he's done early on in life was he helped port Arkanoid uh, in 1986 to MS-DOS. Now, Arkanoid is a game by Taito, Taito being a Japanese company. In fact, the one that made one of my favorite games, Bubble Bobble, back in the mid-80s. So I was curious, okay, David, you've worked with a Japanese company. Have you learned some things in the process about their methods and their values as they differ from ours? And he was clearly, he was kind of guessing a little bit, I mean, like anybody, he did want to help me out. So he was like, I mean, Japan has a different mythology than Western culture. And because of that, they've got more spirits and gods that they can lean on or they can pull upon for their RPGs and things. Maybe that's a factor. But I really, I wanted to get closer to the problem. I didn't just want to know how their culture is different. I specifically wanted to know in their work environments, what does it look like in contrast to American ones? And so to help me out with that, since he didn't have the answers, he put me in touch with Sato Takeyoshi. Now, Sato's been in the game industry also for a long time, making games since at least the early 90s. This is a shot from Sexy Paradis. Uh, the game that he's affiliated with that more people will recognize is Silent Hill 2, for which I believe he was the CG director. And when I met him, he was on Command & Conquer Tiberium, a project that later got cancelled but was in the same studio. And so we had a conversation with Sato during our off hours about differences between American production uh, environments and Japanese ones in relation to video games. Now, I want to contextualize this. This was 2006. So the Wii wasn't out yet. The PlayStation 3 wasn't out yet. I mean, as developers, we knew about them. Uh, even players knew about them from announcements, but they weren't on the market yet. Likewise, the iPhone was a year away, so the App Store didn't exist. So factor that in when you hear this, that it was a different world for digital media. Twitter was only three months old, and Facebook at the time was only accessible to college students, so it hadn't had quite the splash on our whole culture across the country and across the world that it has now. But there are some threads tying 2006 to today. Xbox 360 was out, and PlayStation Portable was out, those are core systems that there's still games being made for. Likewise, World of Warcraft had been on the market for two years by this point, so it already had a good traction, good player base. But these are all things that can help connect 2006 to the way game development and production are thought about today. You know, this isn't the 80s, this isn't the 90s. There are systems that tie us together. One of the first things that he told me was that in Japan, companies tend to hire people right out of college and keep them there practically for life. Uh, and that's, that's from both the employee's standpoint and from the companies. The company does it partly as a way to preserve their secrets, and the employees, uh, it's partly it's a culture thing of duty. It's a culture of not wanting to become a betrayer by leaving their company. And the, the dynamic there is that people will stay with where they're at. And consequently, uh, there's a lot of secrecy in the industry. One of the extreme parts of the industry in terms of secrecy apparently is Nintendo. Sato told me that Nintendo is sort of a black box, even to Japanese developers. So when I'm having these ideas that I'm sharing uh, that he helped pass along to me about how Japanese development is different, they may or may not apply to a Nintendo. It's really kind of speculation on anyone's part. We assume there's some similarities, just as a product of culture uh, and the same educational system and so on. But that said, we really don't know and no one can say because Nintendo pays people well enough and they're happy enough to be there that very few of people who work in Nintendo Japan find their way into other studios to share their sort of best practices. Around this time too, in the mid-2000s, a number of game companies that had footholds in the United States were removing their U.S. footholds. And this is something that we might have not noticed. But in SNES era, back in the 90s, uh, there were game companies in Japan who had American branches helping them out, that throughout the 2000s, especially mid-2000s, were starting to pull all their companies out, except for a few of the big hitters. Of course, Nintendo still has a foothold in the uh, United States, so does Sega, and a few other companies, but a lot of them went back to Japan, making this information even harder maybe to get a hold of. One of the other things about the company's secrecy is that there are very, very, very few, or there were in 2006, books about game design in Japan that are informed by industry. Now, there might be books about game design, but because of the level of secrecy in the industry, they're probably out of touch with what is actually going on in production companies. Just because no one wants to share those secrets, no one wants to go out there and write those books. Because I had a curiosity, I was like, I mean, if those books exist in Japanese, I'd love to find someone to translate them, I'd pay them to translate them for me. But, you know, Sato's answer was the same as David's, those books didn't exist yet. 
Maybe they do now. One of the products of that culture in which uh, people are able to be hired for life is that they have a sense of job security that they may not in the United States. So consequently, games come together with a more cohesive uh, shared vision, or at least the leader's vision in some cases, however it might come out on a team's dynamics, in a way that people don't feel the need to battle each other to get their feature, their boss, their weapon, their item into the game or their art uh, just to prove themselves to the next job. So in the United States game industry, famously, we have a turnover rate of like almost every two years in which basically, if the company doesn't fire you in two years, a lot of us will quit and go somewhere else just because we like to mix things up. We like to work on different kind of environments, like to work with different kind of people. Uh, whereas if you're on the same team your whole life and you have that kind of job security, you're not always having to fight for that thing that for your next job you can point to and be, oh, that part was me. That's why you should hire me here. I think that helps lead to things, and again, this is speculation for Nintendo, but with Wii Sports, if we look at the textures and the models and the gameplay, none of that stuff is fancy. None of that material on its own, nobody who textured for Wii Sports, the smiley face and the basics um, of a, of a low-res stadium, are going to help themselves get a job off of it, even though they worked on Wii Sports, um, in a way that in a game, a bigger scale game in America, you might see every single detail is just sort of overblown. That's really people fighting for their next job. So it's kind of a product, I think, of the economy in place and how we uh, see ourselves in relation to the rest of our careers. In terms of money haggling, one of the things that happens in big studios in the United States that have multiple projects is that they're constantly in competition with each other to get more resources, more, hum more developers on the team, uh, more time to be able to produce, and so they have to do a lot of internal pitching. They've got to develop a lot of internal presentations to impress the right people to try to swing more time and more developers into their favor to get more time to create the game that they have in mind. In Japan, at least as he told me his experiences with Konami, uh, instead, these companies will get a fixed amount of time, a fixed amount of budget, and they have to work within that time frame to make the game that they believe can be made. And so they have to scale their game to fit into a known scope, and there's not a lot of the same stretching, growing pains that might happen on a project in America, where there's a lot less certainty about how long they have to develop it because it's constantly in flux. He told me that when they start game design, they focus on camera movement, on character movement, camera movement, and the control scheme, the, the input mapping to the player's uh, movements around the space. And that this is a, part, a big part of how one game is differentiated from another in terms of its feel. Rather than focusing on, oh, we're just going to adopt first-person shooter kind of mechanics and then change the window dressing of where they're at, uh, they want to make their game feel and look different based on how the character moves, how the camera moves in relation to the character, and how the controls move that character through the space. This is actually something that is a part of what's now called the Cerny Method. Now, Mark Cerny, he has a long history in games. One of his most famous early games that I left growing up was Marvel Madness. And Mark Cerny is someone I always thought was an American developer, but Sato informed me that Mark spent about half of his time, give or take, over, overseas in Japan working on games with Japanese developers. And that it seems like a lot of the ideas that he's helped since pitch as the Cerny Method, he may have partly picked up overseas. So he's kind of that exception, right? to people that work over there for life because he worked there about half the time and was able to cross-pollinate those ideas with Western ideas. It's really worth seeing the Cerny method in more detail. I'll link to the slide share that someone else posted of one of Mark Cerny's talk about method from GDC Europe. But the gist of it here uh, is basically to not go wide on production of a game until you have one or two levels at publishable quality and fun. Basically, you gotta, to use the Miyamoto saying, find the fun, that until you've got the game looking and feeling the way that you want your whole game to look and feel, Keep iterating on that same level. Keep trying things out. And that's actually connected to one of the other ideas from the Cerny Method, which is that if you throw out ideas, if you waste work, especially early on during pre-production, that's not a sign of failure. That's not a sign that you're doing something wrong. That's a sign of good process. Sometimes the only way to know is to try it. Tied to that notion is the idea that you shouldn't have a big game design document. You should start very, very small, minimal in your documentation, just to get people roughly on the same page. And then you sort out a lot of the questions by trying them, seeing what's working and seeing what isn't, and then sticking with that as you move forward. One of the other quirks about a Japanese game company as opposed to an American one is that there are very few, if any, people over there that consider themselves in the company to be a game designer. Now this blows some of our minds because we're used to the idea of, of like the game designer one who's uh, got a lot of say over lead direction or something of that sort. But what you have over there are a lot of technicians, character artists, programmers, directors who are helping to concern themselves with business, each of whom is really a programmer designer, an artist designer, a director designer, and they all have their hands elbows deep into helping to create assets for the game. So in the top left there we see Shigeru Miyamoto uh, drawing character art. On the top right we have MTJ, the guy who was the, uh, I would consider as an American, the, the main game designer for Bubble Bobble. But he really thinks of himself, or at least he did at that time, as the character designer for that game. In the bottom right there's the assistant director from Super Mario Bros. 3. It's from the same booklet I'll link to in my uh, blog entry here that this picture of Miyamoto is from. is on Super Mario Bros. 3. Here we have director of the project and he's literally designing levels. Uh, he's laying out spaces 
for Mario to navigate through, which is not the kind of thing we'd expect to see a director do in the United States. And then the bottom left, I love this bit, Kita Takahashi, who we usually describe in the U.S. as being the main game designer for Katamaro Damacy, has literally said in an interview, I'm not really a game designer. That's just not how they frame their work. You know, you've, like I say, you've got modelers who do game design, you've got programmers who do game design, but in almost every case, it's someone who has some other tangible skill to bring to the team concretely in addition to trying to help make decisions about the game. Connected to this is that they, they might pigeonhole themselves less into specializations than we do here, that more of them have to have a bigger picture of the game shared, and that uh, more of them will go out of their way to sort of try out different roles if necessary just to help get the game across the finish line. It's really common in the United States to see a concept art wall where the whole wall is covered with a ton of variations of a way to draw different images. And so, uh, you know, I've visited studios of various sorts and I can say that there's some high recognition American studios that still do this. It's a perfectly valid and, and reasonable approach to making games and characters and spaces. Uh, to have an artist come up with a bunch of different concepts to see what kind of sticks before they throw the energy into modeling it and texturing it and drawing it up in pixels and whatnot. But, at least as of 2006, he informed me that that's not the process that he was familiar with from Japanese production environments. What he told me is that instead Japanese developers are more concerned with how does it look on screen at resolution, uh, supported by the television screen in this case, uh, at the poly count that you're going to have in the engine, at the texture resolution you'll be able to use, because that's where players will see it. And so you want to focus on what's going to look good on screen in game first and foremost. So if it was a game with pixel art, you would draw the characters in pixels before you would worry about bigger, fancier illustrations. If it's a game with 3D models, you'd worry first and foremost, how will it animate in our engine at the quality we have on the screen that we're working with before you'd worry about the fancier pictures? And that's specifically what he said that they do. That when we see something that looks like concept art, as though they were planning out the image through, uh, through this sort of big, fanciful, emotional imagery, in fact, some of the time what's going on is that these are pictures that happen after the character's already been designed and put into the game. So, you know, like anyone, they may do some planning sketches, but when you see crazy stuff like this, it may in fact be a process of, near the end of the project, engineers are fixing bugs, designers are tweaking on level spaces, uh, or say designers, directors, and everybody else, like I say, who's not just a pure designer. But what's going on there is that these are things that the artists would otherwise be twiddling their fingers because they're done with all the game art at this point, except for change requests. So they use the time to draw the pretty imagery that we might see in a strategy guide or an instruction manual. And that's all I've got to present for now. Different processes yield different results. That's, I think, some of the main differences, at least that I learned about, between Japanese game development culture and American game development culture. That said, these are, of course, generalizations. Uh, they do not apply to every developer in every situation in both countries. There's a lot of gradient between them. So I want to encourage you to think about which practices you may take from sort of that framework of thinking as opposed to the traditionally American culture approach to development. Take what works for you, uh, whether you're a small team, whether you're working alone, whether you're working commercially. Thanks for checking it out. It's Chris Down for Hobby Game Dev. I want to thank you for taking time out of your day to watch the video about the differences between Japanese game development and American game development. Hopefully you found it interesting or useful. Uh, I've been writing Hobby Game Dev now for four years because I'm really passionate about helping people get into game making, and I'm trying to take this more seriously. So if you found it helpful, I'd appreciate it if you either subscribe to the YouTube channel or to my RSS feed for HobbyGameDev.com, my, my sort of written blog. Also, if you're just seeing the video of this, if you follow over to Hobby Game Dev, you'll find more helpful links to Cerny Method, uh, to some of the sources of my other information, uh, including uh, scans of the Japanese children's book with some cool imagery from Super Mario Bros. Series production. Uh, I'm now going to be trying to make about one video per month. That's my goal. Hopefully you can help keep me to it. Uh, I've been converting my apartment slowly into a better place to film, so I've got better lighting, better sound equipment, better video equipment. Uh, I'm really serious, like I say, about trying to help people get into game making. So if you're already doing it, I want to help keep you interested in new ideas, keep you challenged, keep you thinking in different ways to make new and different kind of things. But if you're new to it, or if you've got friends who are new to it, I also want to use some of these videos to make some better screen share tutorials uh, based on some workshops I've been giving as volunteer on the weekends, uh, just to get people into programming, into the basics of writing a game like Pong or a game like Breakout. I'm uh, going to be producing a series of videos for that purpose. So this is Chris Sandler from Hobby Game Dev. I appreciate you tuning in. Um, thanks for checking it out. See you next time.